In part two of this series, we discover the Old Testament understanding of the name of the Lord and what it means for us as believers to use the name of Jesus. We are doing a series on the mighty name of Jesus, which we started last Sunday. For those of you who have not yet downloaded the PDF version of this entire book, we have put this entire series in a book and uh, we have made the book available online on our church website. In case you have not yet downloaded that, we encourage you to please do that. You can go to apcwo.org slash publications. That's a publications page. You'll find this book right at the top of the page and you can download it onto your device and use it to study the Word of God and also follow along uh, during our Sunday services so you can track with me. Uh, and as I mentioned, there will be a lot more in the book than what I would be speaking about uh, simply because of time constraints. Uh, we don't have the, uh, the, the uh, liberty to take time uh, to get into all of that. So uh, we will be summarizing things, moving along a little quickly on our Sunday services. But we encourage you to please study the, 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 the PDF that's been made available. One more thing I just want to bring to our attention is uh, in the PDF, in the book, towards end of each chapter and later on towards the end of every uh, uh, few chapters, there are reflection questions. We'd encourage you to, as you're studying through the book, um, and you're meeting in your life groups or in your Bible study groups, to take time to either discuss these questions as a group or for you personally to reflect on these questions. Uh, it helps internalize, it help you, helps you understand and get a, get a grip on the truth that we are, we are studying together. So please take some time to work through the reflection questions that are given uh, throughout the book. It'll be of help to all of us. Now, just to quickly uh, recap what we did in our opening service last Sunday, the first, service, first sermon in this series, we talked about the reason the name of Jesus is the name above all names. We said it was named the Father gave to the incarnate Son of God. We said that Jesus inherited this name as the Son of God. And also this name was conferred upon him because of what he accomplished, which no one else has ever accomplished. Because of that, this name was conferred on him, given him a name which is about every other name. And then we also took time to look at the person behind the name. A name is only as great as a person who stands behind it. And we need to recognize the greatness of the person so that we know how great this name is. And so we took some time to look at that. And there's a lot more in chapter two. We gave you an abbreviated version of, of the, the actual content. So in chapter two, there's a lot more about the person who is behind the name. And of course, you can definitely add to that. So we want to go forward from there. I'm picking up in chapter three. Now, there are two important things I want to establish, first of all, uh, before we get to talking about our right to use the name. That's the focus of this second sermon, our right, the right to use the name of Jesus. But before we get to that, I want to ha highlight two important things. First of all, is it is important for us to understand that even in the Old Testament times, people understood and used the name of the Lord throughout the Old Testament. And of course, it was progressive. Over time, people began to understand these things. Uh, but we have the advantage of being able to look at the entirety of the Old Testament and see what the name of the Lord meant to God's people in the Old Covenant or in the Old Testament. That's one thing. The second thing we're also going to look at is the fact that Jesus himself came in the name of the Father. So Jesus said, you know, I've come in my Father's name. And so we want to look at the life of Jesus, highlight a few things of how he walked in the name of the Father. Now that, that is important because Jesus then sent has sent us to go in his name. So we're going to do look at these two things and then you're going to move forward into trying to understand our right to use the name of Jesus and what happens when we use the name or speak the name or proclaim the name of Jesus. So when you look at the Old Testament, throughout the Old Testament, there are different names or titles through which God revealed himself to his people. Some of the things that you might be familiar with, for example, is Elohim, translated God throughout the Old Testament, or El, 
Again, it's the name of God, meaning the great mighty one, and that name is connected to various attributes of God, like El Elyon, the most high God, El Shaddai, the God who is more than enough, El Gibor, the powerful, mighty God, and so on. So the El, God, and his attributes are revealed there. Another title that we see that God used in the Old Testament to reveal himself, he said, I am. I am that I am. And, uh, uh, you know, just to reveal, uh, show to us that God is a God who is outside time. God who lives in the eternal now. Uh, for, for God, uh, time is irrelevant. Uh, for us, you know, we talk in terms of time, but God is outside time. He is the everlasting God. He is the I am. Very interesting. In John 8, 58, Jesus used that same title for himself. When Jesus himself said, I am, you know, using the title of God uh, for himself. A very important name of God revealed to us in the Old Testament is Jehovah. Uh, and uh, that is the most common name. Uh, that is a covenant name. A name that God says, I am the eternal, self-existent, immutable God who keeps covenant uh, with my people. It's a very as a covenant name that God used to reveal Himself to His people, and and there were several Jehovah titles uh, that you and I are familiar with. Each title this uh, disclosing another aspect of who God is: Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals; Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. Uh, each of these titles are declaring to God's people that this is who God is to you, uh, and so God was revealing certain aspects of His own nature through all of these titles. Now, having said all of that. What is important for us is to see how the people of God use the name of God in everyday life. Uh, that means they engaged with God through his name. Uh, they engaged in their daily activities using the name of God. Uh, in those activities, uh, in some way, it became their connection with God himself. That's the very name, the mention of the name of God. And it is very wonderful to study the Old Testament, see how they did it, because there is a lot of parallel between how people of God in the Old Testament use the name of God with how you and I in the New Testament use the name of the Lord. And that's what we will cover in the weeks to come, how we use that name. But there's a great parallel and it's wonderful to study. And I'm just going to highlight a few things. You know, we see... For instance, that they called upon the name of the Lord when they wanted to talk to God, pray, uh, worship, so on. Abraham is a great example. The Bible says that as Abraham went from place to place, he built altars and he called upon the name of God, saying, God, I'm calling on you. El Shaddai, you reveal yourself. God, you are more than enough. God, I am in this place, but you are El Shaddai. God, I'm in this place, but you are El Elyon, the Lord Most High. So he called on the name of God as he built altars in various places in an act of worship, an act of his devotion, as an act of his walking with God. And the interesting thing we see also in the Old Testament is that people had encounters with God. And in those moments of encounters, God revealed another aspect of himself through a, a name. Uh, one a great example, again, is that of Abraham himself. Uh, as Abraham, you know, in obedience to God, he goes up to this mountain and it's a tremendous act of faith when he's willing to put Isaac on the altar, as God asked. And he's willing to put Isaac on the altar. And of course, you know, as he's about to offer Isaac, God says, Abraham, that's it, enough, don't do it. I was just testing, I want to see if you really, you know, trust me. And at that moment, Abraham had an encounter with God, and God revealed himself as Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides, the Lord who will see to this thing. So uh, in those moments of encounter, people had a revelation of God. They saw another aspect of who God is. And so that's an interesting thing that, you know, uh, when we encounter God, we see more of who he is. He reveals more of himself to us. Now, the people of God, they used the name of God in various ways. As they walked with God, they used it to sing praises to his name. Uh, they used it when they made, made vows, when they made commitments to people. Uh, they used the name of the Lord in, in various ways. Uh, situations in life. Uh, again, just to highlight something, you know, they they faced enemies in the name of the Lord. So when they were in difficult situations, uh, of course, in those days, they had to go to battle. There were enemy tribes that would attack them or they had to, you know, face up to. Uh, and they did that in the name 
of the Lord their God. And a great example that, you, that we are very familiar with is that of David. And he goes to face Goliath. Now, what does David say? And you know, he speaks to Goliath and says, you know, you're coming to me with all of these weapons, but I am coming to you in the name of the Lord of hosts whose armies you have defied. So he's saying, I'm coming to you in the name of Jehovah Sabbath. The Lord of hosts or the Lord of the armies. I am coming to you in his name. So for David, as far as he was concerned, although he was this one little young fellow going out to meet this giant of a warrior, for him, his confidence was in that name. I'm coming in the name of Jehovah Sabbath, the Lord of hosts. He is with me. And and, and of course, we know the outcome how David kill Goliath. So they face armies, they face enemies uh, in the name of the Lord and expected God to grant them victory. So all of this is very interesting for us to look at the name, uh, names of the Lord. And this was so much part of their everyday life. But here's what I want to point out. You see, in the midst of such a people, the Jewish people, Jesus himself is born. The Son of God is born as a Jew. And just try to imagine this, that he gathers people together, let's say the 12 people to begin with, the 12 apostles. And then he tells them, I want you to go and use my name. Go in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. How would they take to that? Because they had the name of Jehovah, and now he's saying, go use my name. So why would these 12 disciples even venture out? And it's just saying in the name of Jehovah or in the name of you know, El Elyon or El Shaddai or uh, Elohim. Why would they go out there and say in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth? Why would they do that? Two important reasons which are bear uh, importance for us as well. First of all, these 12 apostles, they knew who Jesus was. You know, right from the very beginning, when John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and said, this is the Lamb of God, this is the Messiah, you know, we find that those those early disciples, Andrew, uh, Peter, uh, Philip, Nathaniel, when they followed him, they followed him because he was the Messiah. They believed that completely. Uh, when Nathaniel encounters Jesus, he says, you are the Son of God. You are the Messiah. And when Peter speaks out, you know, in Matthew 16, he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So the reason these 12 apostles even followed Jesus was because they were convinced this is the Messiah. This is the Son of God, firstly. Second reason why they would even go out and use the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth is because they saw Jesus doing the very miracles. And as we will talk a little later, Jesus commissioned them saying, go do it. He gave them the right and they had the boldness now to know know that the Messiah, the Son of God had commissioned them. They could go and boldly use the name of Jesus and they saw results. Now these two truths are very important for us. The reason you and I today can successfully use the name of Jesus. There's two reasons. One, we need to believe completely in who he is. Now, the name of Jesus is not a, a lucky charm or a, just a, you know, a catchy phrase we use. No, we need to believe in the person. And second, we need to know, just like those apostles, that we've been authorized to use his name. We're not using his name just for the sake of saying something. No, there is a heavenly authorization upon us uh, that backs us up in our use of that name. So that is why these 12 apostles and later on the 70 Jewish disciples and others were able to use the name of Jesus. They transitioned from using the name of Jehovah to using the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And they were seeing mighty things take place. Now, I want to move into the next chapter, chapter 4. As we continue understanding uh, our right to use the name of Jesus, it's very important to understand what really goes in to be in a position to use that name. And the best example to look at is, of course, Jesus Christ himself. I want to point us to two verses of scripture. First is John chapter 5, verse 43. This is what Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 43. The scripture will come on your screen or you can turn in your Bible if you'd like to. John 5, 43, Jesus said, I have come in my father's name. And you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. Or in John 10 and verse 25, Jesus said, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do, 
in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. So Jesus is telling the Jewish people, the people listening to him, he says, I have come in my Father's name. The works that I'm doing, I am doing in my Father's name. Now, it is very important for us to understand what that means. Jesus came in the name of the Father. What did that mean? First of all, it means there is delegated authority. There is authority that's been put upon him because he's come representing the Father. I have come in my Father's name. I've come representing him. I've come authorized by him. I have come in my Father's name and in his name, I am doing his works. I'm doing these things as his representative is what Jesus is saying. Now, as you see, for Jesus to say, I've come in my Father's name, it was not just a, a catchy phrase he was using as he was doing things. No, it meant, therefore, that everything about his life revolved or was centered or came out of that focus that I have been sent by the Father, I have been authorized by the Father to represent him, therefore everything I do on earth is going to come out of that call of being sent by the Father. So when you look at the life of Jesus, how he lived, he lived in complete union with the Father. Now that's the point I want to highlight. When you look at the life of Jesus and in chapter 4 we kind of uh, list that out, we describe that. You know, he spent time in the bosom, in close communion with the Father. He was looking as yielded to the Father's will. He was looking to what the Father would say to him so that he can do that. He said the very words that I speak, I speak what I've heard from the Father. The works that I do, I'm doing because I see the Father doing these things. He says the Father loves me. He was resting in the Father's love for him. So his whole life was something that was a, was a life that was lived in complete union with the Father. And out of that, he said, you know, I'm doing these works in my Father's name. I want to highlight that because that's the kind of life you and I should strive to uh, walk in, even as you and I go out in the name of Jesus and go out to do the works in his name. It's got to come from this place of being complete in union with Jesus. Because Jesus said, you know, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. That means we've been commissioned to go the same way the Father commissioned Jesus to come into the earth and do his works. So we've been commissioned in a very similar way. So our life must be similar to how Jesus lived. You know, the Bible tells us in 1 John 2 and verse 6, it says, you know, he who says he abides in him, in Jesus, should walk even as he walked. That means our, our life should be like that, to live in that place of complete union with the Father. Now, another aspect of Jesus coming in the name of the Father, we see this in, in John 17, uh, as Jesus is praying in John 17, verses 6 and verse 26, and I'll just read that. In verse 6, he says, he's praying to the Father, and he says, I have manifested your name to the men you have given me. So he says, I have manifested your name. Now, if you read that from the Passion Translation, it brings up what that means. In verse 6 from the Passion Translation says, Father, I have manifested who you really are, and I have revealed you to the men and women that you gave to me. So when Jesus is saying, I've manifested your name, he's really saying, I've manifested who you are to these people. So to come in the Father's name, not only means that he's been authorized by the Father, but he's uh, He's here to fully, uh, not only does he mean is he sent to represent the Father, but he's here to fully reveal the Father. These three things are very important. When you and I understand that we've been sent in the name of Jesus, it means we've been sent with authorization from the Lord. We've been sent to represent the Lord. We've been sent to reveal the Lord through our life. When we say in Jesus' name, it means I'm authorized by Jesus, I'm representing Jesus, and I'm here to reveal Jesus. It means you're going to see Jesus. In some tangible way, you're going to see him. So that's what it meant to Jesus when he said, I have come in the Father's name. And I'm going to repeat that. When Jesus said, I've come in the Father's name, it meant I've been authorized by the Father. I've been, I'm representing the Father. I'm here to reveal the Father. And Jesus told you and me, as the Father sent me, I have sent you. Go in my name. It means that you and I are here authorized by Jesus, we're here to represent Jesus, and we are here to reveal Jesus to those around us. So 
I want to challenge us as we get ready to learn uh, about using the name of Jesus. This is where it must spring out of. It must spring out of our lives that is lived in complete union with the Father, just as Christ lived his life in complete union. We live our life in complete union with the Lord Jesus. And now he is in us. We are in him. We walk in that union because only when out of that place, we can then do these things. We know we are authorized by him. We represent him and we reveal him. If that union is not there, we will fail in, in, in exercising that name. You know, we'll be able to mouth it, but it's not going to have that same impact because it's got to come out of this place of being in union with Jesus Christ. Jesus, what a beautiful name. forward to chapter 5. Uh, chapter 5 and chapter 6 are the main parts that I want to focus on in this, sermon, in this message today. It is, we must understand that we as believers, every believer has been given the right to use that name, the name of Jesus. You as a believer, you have been given the right to use his name. Now, you may be a young person, you may be a little child, you may be an adult, doesn't matter what your physical age is. If you are a believer, you have been given the right to use the name. Now, I want to just help us see that in the New Testament. You see, after Jesus began his ministry, and, and he had these 12 disciples initially, to, uh, as he started off his ministry, and uh, his 12 disciples saw him do the mighty things. They saw him preach and teach and heal and so on. But then he called these 12 disciples, and he commissioned them. When you read about this in Matthew chapter 10 or in, uh, uh, in uh, verses 1, 7, and 8, and you also read it in the Gospel of Mark and in the Gospel of Luke. And I'll just read from Matthew 10, verses 1, 7, and 8. It says, When he called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Verse 7, And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely you have received, freely give. So that was his commission to them. He says, you go do the same things I'm doing. So they went out and they did it. Now in, 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 the, in the account that we just read in Matthew 10, verse 1, 7 and 8, it doesn't tell us specifically that Jesus told them, go use my name. But we see later on in Luke chapter 9, and Luke's record of this, in the beginning of Luke 9, Jesus commissions the 12 and says, go use my name. Later on in the chapter, Luke chapter 9, around verse 49 and 50, uh, John, one of the 12, 
one of the 12 apostles, he comes back to Jesus and says, Jesus, uh, we saw somebody else using your name and casting out demons. Should we stop him? Jesus says, don't stop him because if he's not against us, that means he's for us. So here we get an idea that, you know, there's, there was somebody else. He wasn't one of the 12, but he believed in Jesus because he probably heard the teachings of Jesus and he saw what Jesus, Jesus was doing. And he got the idea that, hey, I can use the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and do the very works he's doing because I believe in him. So here was this unnamed person, not one of the 12, but this unnamed person who was using the name of Jesus and casting out demons and doing the very works that Jesus was doing. So that's how we understand that Jesus actually commissioned them to go in his name. Now, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus gathers another 70 disciples and he sends them out to do the same thing. But in Luke chapter 10, we can see very explicitly that they were doing the mighty works in the name of Jesus. Because if you look at Luke 10, and verse 17, it says, the disciples came back to these, these 70, they came back to Jesus and they said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Even the demons are subject to us in your name. So obviously these 70 disciples and the 12, then they went out, they were doing the works of Jesus in Jesus' name or in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now, in that context is Luke 10 verse 19. He says, I am giving you authority over all the power of the enemy and nothing will by any means hurt you. So I want you to see the connection there. In the use or through the use of the name of Jesus, we, his followers, we, his disciples have authority over all all the power of the enemy and nothing will by any means hurt us. You know, I, I don't know how many, many times I've heard believers come back and say, oh, I think the devil's attacking me. You know, it's unfortunate for believers to even talk like that. Don't be afraid of Satan. Don't be afraid of any evil spirit. You, are, you have to be so bold I'm not talking about being arrogant or foolish. I'm just saying, you know, just be confident spiritually. For you, you know, Satan has only one place. It's under your feet. Every demon has only one place, and that's under your feet. You know, sometimes believers come back and say, you know, I went and prayed for some person there who was sick, and so the devil attacked me, and I'm sick. You know, that, I just... Don't even like to hear that. That's not the way a believer must be talking. You need to know Luke 10, 19, Jesus said, I, in my name, you are going to have authority over all the power of the enemy. You are going to trample on serpents and scorpions, meaning absolute mastery over Satan and his demons. And he said right there in Luke 10, 19, nothing will by any means hurt you. You are completely protected. The devil may attempt to retaliate, but he said it will not hurt you. So there's only one thing that opens the door to the enemy. It's your fear. So have no fear. Be bold, be courageous. Know the authority that you have in the name of Jesus. You and I must be so convinced that in the name of Jesus, we have authority over all the power of the enemy. Now, as you continue on progressing, and you come to John 14, and in verse 12, a verse that we're familiar with, Jesus said, all of us believers will do the works he did and even greater works. And right after that, in verse 13 and verse 14, Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, you meaning the believer, verse 12, whoever believes in me, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you, right? So right there in John chapter 14, verses 13 and 14, Jesus extends the right to use his name to all believers. When you move to John chapter 16, verses 23 and 24, he says, in that day, referring to the time after his resurrection, which you and I are living in, in that day, he says, you will ask me nothing. Obviously, he's referring to you and me because we are in that time period after his, his resurrection. He says, I'm telling you the truth. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. So he's extending the right to use his name to every believer. And he says, now you use it in prayer to the Father. You ask the Father and he will give it to you. 
One last reference we want to talk about is Mark 16, verse 17 and 18. Jesus says, These signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So it's very clear here in Mark 16, verses 17 and 18, that Jesus extends the right to use his name to all believers. You, as a believer, have been given the right to use his name. To do what? He says, you will speak in new tongues. You will cast out demons. You will, you know, in his name, if, if, if you're drinking any deadly thing, it doesn't mean you intentionally go and drink deadly things. But if people try to poison you or by accident, you eat something harmful, he says it will not hurt you. And he says you will lay hands on the sick and they'll be healed. They will recover. So the right to use the name of Jesus is yours. As a believer, you've been given the right to use his name. What does that mean? Now, in modern language, we will call it the power of attorney. And some of us may be familiar with the, the power of attorney. It means that somebody has authorized you to use their name in order to represent them, to carry out certain activity on their behalf, which they themselves were involved in, and perhaps for a certain duration of time. So usually the power of attorney comes with that understanding. It's you representing that person. It is you doing activity that that person was uh, is, is interested in or is involved in or on behalf of that person and for this duration of time. So every believer has been given the power of attorney. You have been given the power of attorney in the name of Jesus. That means Jesus has, really, has sent you to represent him to do what he would do and also to uh, do it throughout this church age, throughout this time and also in the age to come, in the, in the millennium. You're going to be doing this in his name. Now, I want us to understand that you have been given the right to use his name. And what we want to do as uh, before we close the message today is understand what it means. What does it mean? to use that name. Uh, when you mention that name, whether in prayer, whether in ministering to somebody, whether in speaking to circumstances and situations, what does that mean? Bef we want to talk about that and then we will close. But before we get to that, chapter 6, I also want to bring out this truth that the New Testament teaches us that the Holy Spirit is here in Jesus' name. You know, we understand that the Lord Jesus ascended to heaven and then he sent the Holy Spirit. God, Holy Spirit, is a person in the Godhead. And he has come in the name of Jesus. And that's why Jesus said, you know, I will come to you through the person of the Holy Spirit. And I like how the Amplified puts John chapter 14 and verse 26. It says that when the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, meaning in my place to represent me, and act on my behalf. So the Holy Spirit coming in the name of Jesus means he is here in his place to represent him and to act on his behalf. And he is here in the name of Jesus. You and I are going out in the name of Jesus. So we make a powerful team. The Holy Spirit is working with us to glorify Jesus. And we are here in the name of Jesus to represent him, to act on his behalf and the Holy Spirit is here to do the same thing. So let's talk about, this is chapter seven. Let's talk about what happens when you and I mention the name of Jesus. This is so important. What happens? You see, when you say in Jesus name, it means you're saying, I am here exercising my power of attorney. I am exercising my delegated authority. I am stepping out on what heaven has authorized me to do. So don't just say the name of Jesus in a very light way. Say it in a very dignified way. Say it in a very confident way. Because you are actually, as far as the spiritual realm is concerned, you are acting on your power of attorney. You are stepping out on your delegated authority. You've been authorized by heaven. And so you're stepping out on that. Secondly, when you and I, when we say in the name of Jesus, we are saying, I'm here to do something 
representing Jesus, acting on his behalf to do something that he would do if he were present here himself. That's what you're saying. When you're saying in Jesus name, you are saying, I am here to do what Jesus would do. I'm representing Jesus. I'm acting on his behalf and I'm doing this, doing something that Jesus would do himself if he were here. That's what you're saying in Jesus name. So you're stepping out on a heavenly authorization. You're stepping out to represent and reveal Jesus Christ. And you say in Jesus name. Thirdly, when you and I say in Jesus name, it means it brings the very presence of God there. You know, the name of Jesus brings Jesus in. We understand this because Jesus said, if you're gathered in my name, I am there. See, the name of Jesus brings Jesus in. The very person of Jesus is there. So when you say in Jesus name, in your heart and mind, it's as good as Jesus is here and Jesus is doing this thing through me. When I lay hands on somebody in the name of Jesus, in your heart and mind, it is as good as Jesus laying hand on that person. When I speak to an evil spirit in the name of Jesus, it's as good as Jesus speaking to that evil spirit because Jesus is here. At the mention of his name, he is there. Number four, and you and I say in Jesus' name, it means the very person of the Holy Spirit comes there, the very power of God. We mentioned that the Holy Spirit is here in the name of Jesus. So when you say in Jesus' name, the Holy Spirit, Spirit is there. The very power of God is there to flow through you. So when you and I say in Jesus' name, understand the significance of what we are doing. It's not a simple thing. It's not an ordinary thing. It's very powerful. So dwell on what we've written here in this chapter, in chapter 7, on what it means to use the name of Jesus. I want to close with this thought. You know, therefore, it becomes incumbent upon us. It's our responsibility now to represent Jesus accurately. Don't say in Jesus' name to do something that Jesus would not do. That's inaccurate representation. So how would you and I know what Jesus would do? Two things. One, see how what Jesus was in the Gospels. Imitate that because he's the same. He has not changed. When he saw a wind, the winds and the waves, what did he do? He stood up and he said, peace be still. When he met people with various needs, you know, there was a time when there were more than 5,000 people in front of him and he felt that the Lord Father, the Father wanted to feed them. What did he do? He said, let's give them something to eat. You know, it wasn't too big. He took five loaves, two fish, blessed it, multiplied it, met the needs of the people. You know, when Jairus got bad news, he says, your daughter is dead. Don't trouble the master. What did Jesus say? Fear not, only believe. You see, that's Jesus. And we have to imitate Jesus. We have to represent, represent him accurately. Secondly, in order to represent Jesus accurately, listen to the Holy Spirit. Remember we said the Holy Spirit is here in his name. So the Holy Spirit is going to teach us what Jesus is saying. And the Holy Spirit is going to help us represent Jesus accurately. So how can you and I represent Jesus accurately? By following the example of Jesus as seen in the Gospels and listening to the Holy Spirit. He's going to help us represent him accurately. So imagine when you go to pray to the Father, don't ever pray a prayer that Jesus didn't pray or Jesus wouldn't pray. For example, you don't find Jesus ever praying for a sick person saying, oh Father, if it be your will, heal him. But today we have so many people praying like that and they end it in the name of Jesus. Is that a right prayer to pray? Would Jesus pray a prayer like that? He never prayed a prayer like that in the Gospels. You never find Jesus praying for a sick person and saying, Oh, Father, please heal this man if it's your will, otherwise take him home. Jesus never prayed a prayer like that. And so you and I have no right to pray that kind of a prayer in his name. Don't do that, right? Because when you say in Jesus' name, you're saying, I'm authorized by him. I'm representing him. I'm standing in his place to do what he would do if he were here. So whenever you pray, you only pray the kinds of prayers Jesus would pray if he was there. What would Jesus pray in that situation? How would Jesus pray? How would Jesus act? You pray those prayers because when you pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, it's as good as Jesus signing off on that prayer. Would Jesus sign off on a prayer that he would, ever, he would not pray? No. 
So make sure when we pray to the Father, we pray the kinds of prayers that Jesus himself would pray. And if we are not sure, then look at the Gospels and listen to the Holy Spirit and pray those kinds of prayers. So understand today, you and I as believers have been authorized by Jesus to use his name and understand the spiritual significance of using that name. That when you and I mention the name of Jesus, it means we're stepping out on our power of attorney. And I'm just repeating, we're stepping out on our power of attorney. We're here to represent and reveal Jesus. We are, we, the very presence of Jesus comes in on that place. Jesus himself is there. When we say in Jesus' name, the very power of the Holy Spirit comes there. When we say in Jesus' name, we are taking his place to do what he would do if he were there. So we must represent him accurately. We pray the kinds of prayers and we speak the kinds of things that Jesus would speak and do according to what we see in the Gospels and according to what we hear the Holy Spirit tell us. Do what Jesus would do in his name. You've been authorized to do that. We're going to pray, but before we pray, our worship team will lead us in a song. And uh, right after that, I'm going to come and pray. And when we pray, I want us to believe. You know, we've heard the word of God and the word of God has built faith in our hearts. We're going to pray together. Because there is power in the name of Jesus. Because there is power So let's take some time to pray right now as we pray in the name of Jesus. Understand how powerful it is. I might be speaking from here, coming to you where you are through the internet. But when we mention the name of Jesus, right where you are, you can expect the Lord to touch you. You can expect the Holy Spirit to touch your life. And I'm going to speak healing over you healing to bones, healing to the nerves, healing to your joints, healing to the muscles, healing to you, deliverance, breaking of all bondages of your mind, your emotions, getting rid of fears, all of this in the name of Jesus. And I just want you to receive it because in his name, there are many things that will take place. Let's pray. 
Father, we've heard the word of the mighty name of Jesus, how powerful it is. And so in the name of Jesus, I lay hands on people listening, watching. In the name of Jesus, let sicknesses, diseases depart, that healings take place. In the name of Jesus, I command people to be made whole and restored. I command uh, people or those whose optic nerves have been affected, let their sight be restored, let it be made perfect. In the name of Jesus, let bones be healed, let people who had fractures in other ways hurt themselves be made whole. In the name of Jesus, let fears be expelled and let people be set free from bondages. Lord, in the name of Jesus, let needs be met. Let miracles take place that bring your divine provision into the lives of your people. And I speak these things and I declare these things and I command these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, on the other side, if you've agreed with me and received this, we want to hear your testimony. Send us an email to testimony at apcw.org and tell us what the Lord has done in your life this morning or this uh, wherever, whatever time that you watch the service. Uh, share that with us so we can rejoice. And over time, we'll be able to share uh, your testimony with the people, of course, without disclosing your name or your personal details, but that we could celebrate the Lord together. Thank you so much for being with us on the service today. Remember to share this message with as many people as you can. God's people need to know what it means to use the name of Jesus. So share this with as many people as you can. Tell them they need to listen to this message. Encourage them to download the book and use it and get together in groups, study this, and, and just build yourself up in knowing how to use the mighty name of Jesus. God bless you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen.